program is a repeat. The phone and text lines are now closed. Please do not phone or text as you may still be charged. Enjoy the show. Tonight, politicians from the DUP, Sinn Féin and the Conservatives join a leading business representative and public appointments expert as we tackle the big issues. What's on your agenda tonight? Cost of living? Covid? The protocol? Let's find out as our panel answers your questions on Spotlight Special. Hello and welcome to Spotlight Special. Our panel tonight. Chris Hazard is the Sinn Féin MP for South Down and previously represented the constituency at Stormont, where he was also Infrastructure Minister. Also joining us is Christopher Stolford, who is a DUP MLA for South Belfast and Deputy Speaker of the Stormont Assembly. He was a prominent supporter of Edwin Poots in his bid for the leadership of the party. Joining us from his North Dorset constituency is the chair of the Northern Ireland Affairs Committee, Conservative MP Simon Hoare. You may have heard of the ERG, but Mr Hoare is not a member of that staunchly pro-Brexit Conservative grouping. He is, in fact, a member of the TRG, the Tory reform group, which promotes a centrist Conservative position. Accountant and commentator Felicity Houston is also with us in the studio as a former Commissioner for Public Appointments in Northern Ireland. She has a deep interest in the issue of good governance here. And he's become known to many viewers in Northern Ireland as the guy with the big beard and the big hat who's often talking about Brexit. But Aidan Connolly, who represents some of our biggest retailers here, has left the hat behind tonight. But the beard and the insight are both very much still with us. And our questions tonight come from our virtual audience who join us from home. There they are. Maybe they can give us a wave. You too can get involved in the conversation at home by tweet, text, by phone or email. You can text your comments throughout the programme to 81771. You can also phone us on 030 30 80 55 55. Standard charges from landlines and mobiles will apply. You can drop us an email to spotlightspecial at bbc.co.uk. We're also on Twitter. Use the hashtag SpotlightNI or follow at BBC Spotlight NI. The details are now on the screen. Our first question this evening is from Kevin Green, who's a web developer from Eglinton. So, uh, hello everyone. Is collapsing the executive the right approach to force the EU to remove the protocol or just political recklessness? Let's go straight to Christopher Salford, DUP. It's your party that has collapsed the executive, to use Kevin's words there. Is that just recklessness? I think it's important that we establish that the very first principle is that Northern Ireland can work but it needs to work on the basis of both communities, both main communities. Of course, we have different communities here now, but both main traditions here, unionism and nationalism, moving forward together. I think that for his part, our party leader, Sir Geoffrey Donaldson, has been more than patient uh, with the government. Some people thought that he moved too slowly on these issues, and some people didn't want him to move at all. I think that what we have done, we have said, we have repeatedly said to the government that the provisions contained within the protocol do not command the support of the unionist community. And there's not a single elected unionist representative in Stormont who does support the protocol. And I think it's important now that the government makes good on their commitment, their commitment in new decade, new approach, which was that there would be no internal trade barriers uh, within the United Let's Kingdom. To the question again, you're asked, is it the right approach to get the EU uh, to remove the protocol? How does you collapsing the executive, uh, force the EU to change its approach? Well, the First Minister has resigned, which means there's no Deputy First Minister uh, in place either. But I have come from Stormont today where legislation's being passed and where decisions are being taken. And we know that later on this evening, the decisions taken by the Health Minister will be enacted in terms of the easing of restrictions. So there is an element of government still taking place and decisions are still being taken. But I think that the leadership of unionism, I think the unionist community in general, have been more than patient with this government. And it's now time for this government to see good on their promises, their pledges, a new decade, new approach. All right, uh, Sinn Féin, uh, Chris Hazard, what do you make of uh, the DUP tactics on this? 
Well, I think is, is the question outlined, is this a good attempt to get rid of the protocol? Well, well, the answer is no, because there's no getting rid of the protocol. And I think this is the big contradiction when it comes to the DUP. And, and Edmund Putz previously, when he was leader, he recognised the protocol was here to stay. Jeffrey described it first as a gateway of opportunity. People understand that there are issues that need to be dealt with with the protocol, but that place is the joint committee. That place is the infrastructure and the architecture that's been negotiated between the European Union and the British government. Adults sitting around the table talking about the issues, business leaders talking about the issues, working out compromise and where we go forward. You know, how do we, uh, you know, protect trade going forward? It's not about stunts and Stormont. Stunts and Stormont don't register in Brussels. That's and if, if anything, all they do is raise tensions here and amongst our community. It serves nothing. And if anything, it is a hugely destabilising process, our impact on our political process. And the one thing I would say, it reminds me actually of how the civil war within the Conservative Party in London spilled over into the Brexit Party the Brexit process over the last few years. The civil war within the DUP over the last couple of years is spilling out into our political process now and it's paralysing the process at Stormont. Three leaders in the last year, the DUP don't know which okay. way to turn on Brexit and it's damaging well, for I'll, everybody. I'll come back uh, to uh, the DUP uh, shortly, but Simon Hoare, uh, you've got to mention there, the Conservatives uh, have had their own troubles uh, over Brexit. Uh, but what about uh, what we're seeing now uh, with Stormont? Uh, you know, by removing the First Minister, collapsing the executive. Uh, is it a warning shot to the British government and indeed uh, to the European Union that they need to do something about this protocol? To answer the question directly, uh, is it the right response? Uh, no, I don't think it is. Uh, is it politically reckless? Well, it might be. But I do think it's politically selfish. The people of Northern Ireland, of all traditions and of none, are now looking to their politicians to put their shoulders to the wheel as we come out of COVID, to build up the economy, to deal with delays in healthcare, in education, in infrastructure and the like. And people, as I said in the House of Commons last week, can shout about the protocol, can, can campaign against the protocol, protest against it, etc. But we should be able to divorce two things. We should be able to deal with issues of the protocol, but also continue public service. And I think to uh, abandon that as a way of, whether it's brinkmanship or blackmail, call it what you will, I think he's not grown up politics, and I very much regret it, hope that there can be seen some rethink, and that people get back around the table to continue to serve the people who are looking for that service, and who elected those people to serve them, not themselves. Well, I want to go back to Kevin, our questioner, in a moment. But first, uh, Aidan Connolly, I mean, you're, to some extent, you're representing uh, business here in Northern Ireland. You've got into the detail of the protocol and Brexit uh, over the last few years. Uh, in terms of knowing the tactics here and the questions about essentially the tactics, do you think this will have an impact with Europe and, and perhaps uh, shift things on the protocol, get rid of it? I think when we have to remember what, where this came from and, and whenever the protocol was announced uh, by the Prime Minister, we, in fact, I'm on record as saying that he hadn't listened to Northern Ireland communities and he hadn't listened to especially the Northern Ireland business community. But, but it came in. We tried to get amendments. They didn't go through. It, it came in and we have worked really hard to make changes. We have worked really hard to make as best that we can from it. However, there are still challenges, but those talks are ongoing. Now, I can't speak for the politicians and I can't get into the po political arena. But one thing I do know is that business likes certainty. And it's not just about the certainty of a solution to the protocol that provides stability, certainty, simplicity and affordability, because that's the big ask that the business community has. But it's also about political stability here. If you look at the opportunities that could come from the protocol once we get past those challenges. A lot of them are based on FDI, foreign direct investment. And we have a wonderful offer here in Northern Ireland. It's something a lot of the business people are hugely passionate about. We have a good skill base, relatively low wages, a relatively high standard of living. But we won't get foreign direct investment unless we have political stability. That is the biggest push away factor that we have. OK, I want Chris Rostoffer to come back in that in a moment. But, but before that, uh, let's just go to uh, Kevin who asked the question. Kevin, uh, what's your own thoughts on this and what do you make of what you've heard so far? Well, you see, I think collapsing the executive in a time of crisis demonstrates uh, a, reckless, a reckless disregard for the electorate that voted for the politicians to act on their behalf, especially when it comes to steadfast negotiating of complex issues. So our politicians need to present intelligent solutions to solve difficult issues 
And by walking away at a time of crisis, just doesn't make any sense. It shows a disregard for the electorate. But it's, it's from an ethical point of view, it's absolutely not healthy. OK, uh, Felicity Houston, you supported Brexit. I did. Um, do you support the protocol or do you think that the, it needs to go and do you think the DUP have done the right thing? Um, well, I, you know, it's one of those questions, as we would say in Northern Ireland, if you wanted to get to there, you wouldn't start from here. And I think that is our fundamental problem. You know, I think of back in May 17, the head of the Irish Revenue Commissioners gave evidence to the Irish um, Parliament about how it could be done electronically and he didn't foresee any need for customs posts and all that stuff. And, you know, and I mean, the BBC reported on, uh, quite extensively on this. And if that had gone ahead like that, we wouldn't be here. But unfortunately, policy changed within the Irish government and, and we've ended up where we are. I think what has happened with the DUP is sheer exasperation. I mean, this just goes on and on and on and, and different things happen and we're promised all sorts from Westminster and it just doesn't happen. So you have some sympathy with their position? I have. Um, I don't know whether Europe actually understands us enough to care about the impact this may have on us. I think they see us as an, a tool to punish the United Kingdom for the decision it made. And I think that's very, very wrong. And has, has, I don't think they've really recognised the, the tensions that have developed in Northern Ireland because of it all. Um, so I can see where it's coming from. Whether it will make any difference, because I say I don't think Europe really okay. cares well, let very me much. Go back to the Interesting audience. To um, see. Uh, Adam, I think, uh, wanted to come in there. Uh, Adam, what are your thoughts? Yeah, I just wanted to make a few comments about what's been said so far. Even though the First Minister and Deputy First Minister are gone, the protocol is still with us. It's going to like it's going to remain with us. There's no getting rid of it. It has. It, it's there. It has to be. It has to be. Has to work. Uh, Christopher Salford, you've got maybe some support from yeah. Felicity Houston that there's a bit of exasperation, perhaps, uh, amongst people. But in terms of the tactics, can you explain to us again how you think there's, this is going to force the there's EU? A, there's a few points. Change? There's a few points I want to make on on the back of what I've heard. Firstly, I, I think Felicity's right in terms of not only does the European Union not understand Northern Ireland, but it's quite evident that the chair of the Northern Ireland Affairs Committee doesn't either. Because unlike him, I actually draw a mandate from people in Northern Ireland and I'm reflecting the views of the community that I represent who say that the protocol is unacceptable to them. And the principle by which this place is governed is that the two main political traditions have to move forward together. We have to make things work together. And it should be quite apparent to Mr Hoare if he wishes to listen. But that there is not Simon the support. Hoare, what about his boss, the Prime Minister? And, Does he understand? And he is a member of the Conservative Party who are in government. I'm not entirely certain that the Prime Minister does understand, to be quite honest. But they made a commitment, a new decade, new approach, that there would be no barriers to trade within the United Kingdom. If I could just take up one point on what Chris Hazard said, he has now acknowledged that there, we need changes to this aspect, we need negotiations over that aspect. That is far removed from demanding rigorous implementation, Absolutely which not. was the position that Sinn Féin and other Remain parties in the Assembly took. They wanted the fullest implementation I'll, I'll of the protocol. Minute, but, uh, let's go to the audience again. Caroline uh, wanted to say something. Caroline. Yeah, I just wanted to recognise first, you know, that Christopher has actually acknowledged that there is more than two communities in Northern Ireland, yet we see this political football between nationalism and unionism all the time. And the people, us, the electorate, we're the ones that's paying the price for this political football that just goes on all the time. You what know, do you think they should just, do about it's never the, ending. What and should they do about the protocol, Caroline, then? I think it needs, it, it potentially needs fixed. I don't fully understand it, you know, and it potentially does need fixed. But pulling government down, you know, and leaving that there is excess money sitting there where our government that we elected in can't make decisions and can't spend that money right now because, you know, the DUP doesn't like what's going on, you know. Um, sit down and work it out together. Thanks for that. Uh, Chris Hazard, I mean, you did at one stage ask for the rigorous implementation of the protocol uh, and now you do want to see changes made to it. 
I said from the start, and Sinn Féin have said from the start, we want to see the implementation of the protocol. That means work the mechanisms within the protocol to find those simplifications, to find the modifications. That's in the text. That's, anybody that's ever been pro the protocol from the start has always said that. I don't think anybody has said from the start, this is the final item, this is the perfect thing that we need. Nobody has said that. And let's not get away from the point. Brexit was the midwife to the protocol. We are in this situation because of Brexit, a hard Brexit that the DUP championed at every single turn. They could have had Brexit with a customs union that Theresa May was offering. They undermined her. The DUP colluded with right-wingers within the, the Tory party to bring her down. And they put in place Boris Johnson, who sold them down the river with their protocol. The DUP, I'm afraid the chickens are coming home to roost. This is of the DUP's making. Nonsense. And this talk about consent, it's not about two communities. Nonsense. There was no mandate for Brexit okay. in the North. The people well, were opposed to Brexit. All the Brexit right now, but I think Emma wanted to come in there in the audience. Uh, Emma. Um, so I just wanted to um, make a point to all of the audience, and I really appreciate Felicity's points when she's saying about the tensions within our communities, because a lot of the people within the community, I'm from East Belfast, um, the, the measure of temperament in our community is that we have been promised multiple things, not only by the DUP, but also by Boris Johnson. I asked Boris Johnson a question on the, on the radio a, a few years ago, and he said absolutely no point was there going to be any trade barriers between Northern Ireland and the rest of the United Kingdom. The Tory party continues to not deliver in their, in their promises to the people of Northern Ireland. And so while I won't be, I'm not the, the DUP's greatest fan, I have empathy for the DUP in feeling that they have had to take this action. Okay, uh, what Simon does Hoare. Mr. Hoare say in response to my comment? Yeah, Simon Hoare, uh, respond to that. Well, is there an understanding of the issues in Northern Ireland? Yes, of course there is. Could it be better and deeper and stronger? Um, absolutely. Um, and I think I understand entirely why people are annoyed with the position that we're at. I think Chris has it is right that the backstop proposal would have eased this uh, incredibly well for the whole of the United Kingdom. Uh, but the Felicity said, you know, we are, where, we are where we are. All I can say is that in Westminster, I think all of us who have an interest in and experience of Northern Ireland are straightening every sinew to try and solve this, these issues to the benefit of all of those who live in Northern Ireland, irrespective of which community or tradition they may or may not uh, belong to. And I think that's the important thing, to try and get it right. And if I could, just while I've got the camera, could I just say to... Uh, to to, to Chris Dalford, uh, there's a great deal of difference, Chris, between understanding an issue and having that understanding determined by whether or not I agree with your party's position. Because I don't agree with the DUP on everything, it doesn't mean I don't understand things, it means that we just don't agree. And okay, I would have um, thought in a democracy that's allowed. And if I could make this other point, you made the point I don't represent a Northern Irish constituency. No, I didn't make that You're point. right. And no, I would I have didn't. thought as a unionist, mm -hmm. I didn't um, make, you actually, would I didn't make that point. Northern Irish politicians getting involved? No, I didn't actually. Possibly. I didn't actually make that point. The point that I made you did. was. I heard no, you. I didn't. The point that I made was. Yes, you that, did. The point that I made was that you don't draw a mandate from Northern Ireland and you're not a representative of the unionist community in Northern Ireland. I am, and I know that I'm speaking for them when I say that the Northern Ireland Protocol has to go because that is the expressed opinion of the people that votes for me. Okay, we'll have and to when, it comes to the, when it comes to the unionist, the unionist stakes, I'll wager my credentials against yours any day. Okay, we'll have to leave uh, this particular question there, but move on to our next one, uh, which perhaps is related. And this next question comes from Callum Irvine, who's a Queen student who lives in Belfast. <coughs> Callum. Good evening. After more political instability at Stormont, is it safe to say Stormont isn't working? Chris Hazard, we've been talking about the DUP pulling the executive down, your own party uh, pulled the whole show down for three years. Uh, so you've demonstrated yourself, perhaps, uh, that the system just doesn't work. Well, I disagree that we pulled it down for three years. Uh, in 2017, Martin McGuinness decided to resign from the, the administration of Stormont because Arlene Foster would not step aside. Every other political party agreed with Martin at that stage. People will not forget the, the scenes of Arlene speaking to an empty chamber. It wasn't just Sinn Féin who walked away from that. There's no government in the world in 2017 would have stood over a financial scandal like RHI, and I make no apology for that. I was part of the Sinn Féin negotiating team in 2018, which had a deal on the table, which included Irish language, that the DUP simply couldn't sell to their team. Fast forward two years on from that, Arlene Foster was standing in the Assembly. She was saying, Sinn Féin, an Irish language act is going to have to be 
involved here going forward. So we could have had a deal in 2017, 2018 to restore power but sharing. I suppose but the on, on the face of it, it has, have, have the last number of years not just shown think, that, that it's not working? I mean, for instance, I actually, in 22 I actually years disagree. of devolved government, it's been last, out of business for one third of the time. So I actually disagree. See, since it was restored in 2020, I think the last two years have shown that progressive parties and those parties opposed, not just the DUP, have been able to get on with work quite well in the Assembly, have been able to progress legislation, have been able to find common ground. And I think that's actually playing into the DUP, that they are not able to block progress. Continually now the DUP are losing votes at the Assembly. And I think that's significant. And I think the dysfunctionality that we've seen in the DUP, some of it is because they feel they have lost control and they feel that they cannot block progress now at the Assembly. And that's why we've seen three DUP leaders in the last year. And okay. that's why we see Paul Given now resigning. Chris Salford, is it fair to say, as Callum asks, uh, that Stormont isn't working? Well, I'm not going to uh, political point score the way that Chris Hazard just did, uh, beyond saying I can understand fully why people are frustrated with the Assembly, and I can understand fully why people question the value of the Assembly, because there are occasions when uh, particular issues arise that don't cast the Assembly in a good light. I think that we have now reached a critical juncture in terms of the future of devolution, do we want to move forward with the two main political traditions working together or do we want domination one over the other? And I think the, the previous speaker perhaps pointed in a certain direction. Northern Ireland can only work if we all move forward together. And I think devolution allows us the best aegis for that. I certainly would not be happy in trusting the future of my children to a direct rule government, uh, certainly not. Uh, direct rule ministers drawn from the current government. Okay, so, so I'm, you I'm in be, favour of devolution. You're in favour of devolution. You don't want to trust it to direct rule. Mm -hmm. So therefore, can you give a guarantee that after the election you'll be back in government come what may? I want us to be back in government and I want us to be leading that government. But I recognise the frustration that there is, particularly within the community that I represent, that there is a belief that things are not being carried out in a fair and equitable fashion. And so we you'll need leave to move to forward. Direct rule ministers. We need to move forward on the basis of the two main political traditions here working together, along with other people who are from outside of those traditions. But I but totally I, I, understand why people feel and question the value of devolution. But, but you haven't said that you will commit to going back into government. I'm committed to us winning the next election and leading a government on the basis of fairness, on the basis of the issues around the protocol being resolved, but other issues as well. But it needs to be on the basis of a fair and equitable outcome. OK, Felicity Houston, is Stormont working? Is it fair to say that it isn't? Well, it's, it's unfortunate because the last question was about, you know, things that aren't working either. And it's, it's the same. I mean, I was actually a founding member of the Women's Coalition. So my children, in fact, my second son was a tiny baby when I was campaigning for the forum elections and all that came with it. And he's now 26 and things still aren't right. And I find that deeply depressing. Is there uh, an alternative? <clears throat> Well, that is the problem, isn't it? I mean, I was a great believer in devolution. I thought it would be wonderful to no longer, with apologies to Simon, be run by men from England, that we would finally look after ourselves. And when you went to see a minister and talk about the bus service, he would know what you were talking about. That had to be a success. But unfortunately, the past 25 years have shown that it are we not ready for it? Can we still not manage it? I think there is a structural issue about a compulsory coalition which makes it incredibly difficult for people to work together who have, you know, I could vote for Chris's party, I could vote for the Green Party, etc. But I have no idea whether any of their policies will ever be implemented because they're all stuck in together. Uh, and, you know, they can promise me everything, but who knows whether that will ever be the case or not, because everybody has to work in this coalition where they've all got different views and, and of the theories and ideas about even the structure and so you're not convinced that, that it is working then, really? No, no, it's, it's just not. And I have to say, gentlemen, those of you who are elected, when you weren't here for three years, after a while we didn't notice. Uh, I'm sorry. Simon Hoare, <laughs> Felicity Houston, says she doesn't want this place to be run uh, by politicians uh, from England. But is that the alternative that we're, we're staring at now? Well, I mean, Felicity, that makes two of us. Because I agree with you entirely. You want to have local politicians who know their patches and know their people who can find the solutions and work together. And if we were having this debate about devolution in Scotland or Wales, there, this would be the front page headlines of every newspaper. Uh, and, and, and that is the problem. I think there's two things we've got to do. We've got to move away from the otherness of Northern Ireland. Mm -hmm. And we have to have a gear shift in the political mindset, which is 
you win some and you lose some, but you stay in, you fight your corner, you make your argument, but you keep the institutions going to serve the public. We have to get out of the lexicon of political usage or the toolbox of political usage, I should say, which is if we don't like the way it's going, we're going to collapse it, we're going to frustrate it, we're going to go on and go slow. People expect more. We're all taxpayers. We're all looking to our, to our politicians to solve the problems of today, whether it's health, education, infrastructure, and the like. Well, and let me bring in some of those, um, let me bring in some of those taxpayers. It's not public service. Yeah, let me bring in some of those taxpayers that you mentioned, uh, Simon Hoare. I think Brian in our audience perhaps has his hand up there. Uh, Brian, what did you want to say? Um, yeah, thanks for the panel for uh, listening to our questions. But the Good Friday Agreement had a citizens forum um, that was dissolved, uh, I think, when uh, DUP and Sinn Féin came into power. Um, and the new decade, new approach made a commitment um, for two, uh, one citizens assembly a year. We're now in the third year and we've had none. Um, would people not agree that maybe having citizens involved more would make hard decisions easier? Okay, uh, Ibn Connolly, um, you know, civic society, and you represent uh, some of the big retailers here. Uh, and you know, small ones. And, and small <laughs> ones, and maybe some other workers too. Um, do people pe feel that they're excluded from this storm and isn't working, and, and maybe it is time for, for a change? Um, I don't think so. Um, personally, uh, not only do I like uh, devolution, I believe strongly in devolution. I believe in the politics of compromise. I believe in trying to move this forward. Um, as far as a constitutional position, my constitutional position is very clear. I want to make this place better than when it was when I came into it. That's as simple as it, as it gets. making things better? When Stormont collapsed, we lost the, the ability to pass the budget bill. And that is one thing which is not just for business, but for charities. And I've just come from a, a charity board meeting and the chair of two charities who were looking forward to maybe getting three-year budgets. Now, that is hard for them to start planning for three years when they're back to, to, to one-year budgets. But in 2016, uh, when it collapsed, I was looking through old press releases, 2016, 17, 18 and 19, I put out press releases at the same time saying that it was scuppering our ability to get investment and it was stopping bills that needed through uh, going through uh, happen. We do know that it works. In this past few days, we've had Dahi's bill pass on organ donation. And I know that was a big struggle. A lot of people uh, were, were, were involved in trying to get it passed. And there was a, on social media, there was a general smile among people in Northern Ireland when they saw it pass. But one of the biggest tragedies that we have had here is from 2016 to 2019, we didn't have our committee system. So whenever the, uh, the debate about Brexit was going on, when the debate about what type of Brexit was the debate about how it would affect us. We were reliant, no offence Simon, but we were reliant on Westminster committees rather than committees here who actually understand, as Felicity said, the bus routes right through to the trade routes. Okay. And, and that's what we missed. Well, Simon Hoare's getting uh, some of the brunt of it uh, the, this evening, but let me bring her questioner back in, uh, Callum. Uh, you want to come back on that? Yeah, I just want to say, I sort of see Stormont as a tale of two halves. You know, as Owen said, there has been legislation we've seen lately in Duffy's Law and the domestic abuse legislation where we can see it making a real difference uh, to people's lives. But then there's examples even today of, you know, the futility of Stormont and that, you know, for instance, the integrated education bills come up. I mean, I know that that's going to be blocked with a petition of concern. Um, we've heard today about the money for the uh, football stadiums as well as having to be handed back to Westminster. And, you know, I just think that, you know, it's a tale of two halves. On one hand, you've got sort of very progressive stuff that's making a difference. And then on the other hand, you, there's this other, you know, stuff as well. It's just not, it, it looks very dimly in the eyes of the public. Um, let me just bring, I'll go back to our two uh, elected politicians here from Northern Ireland. I mean, Chris Hazard, can you name one measure uh, by which you can say Stormont has made a real difference? Is it in waiting lists? Because that doesn't seem to be the case. Educational attainment, sure. uh, the economy in general. Mm. Uh, can you point to something and say that's why Stormont is working? Well, there's lots of examples, but the one I would point out immediately, and especially the, the, the environment we're in, is Dairy Hargy giving £200 million to over 280,000 families, £200 payment, 
Um, but to be able to so be able that's a small beer compared to the big stuff we're talking about. <laughs> it's small beer, okay, I know, so but a small beer, a small beer. If no, you're trying in, to heat, in, in you're choosing between heat and heat. Over a period of 22 years of elected government, can you only point to Deidre Hargy's initiative no. uh, on that, or can you talk about something big such as educational attainment, the economy, health? Well, you, you only have to look today, for example, at the rise in north-south trade. You know, it's up 65% the last year. I think some of our investment agencies have been working very hard. Something else David Hargy did in recent weeks was been in the bedroom tax. Again, we have far better mitigations. There's only something like 900 families affected by that. What about the 1.8 million If you let, let, you let me finish, Jim. We, through negotiations, Stormont was able to deliver much better mitigation against Tory welfare assault than any other part of these islands. I think when Stormont works well, it works very well. People forget we have a five-party coalition on a post-conflict society. It is very, very difficult. Difficult. Of course it is. Where I want to go to is to get away from the type of green and orange okay, transactional well, well, politics. Just on then the, 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 the fundamentals of this question, then would you guarantee that in the next Assembly mandate you will not be pulling out of government uh, for whatever reason? Well, we, we want to be there. We think the democratic process has to lead. The people will decide who's First Minister. The people will be deciding who's the biggest party, who's the smallest party. The onus is on all of us to get in there, to change the people's lives. People are living in very, very difficult okay. times at the Chris moment. Chris Rassol, for we have to, do to that. you then. Uh, what's the big achievement? What can you tell people on the doorstep uh, that they should bother going out uh, in any future election? Well, I think in terms of just uh, the headline over the course of the last 20 years, I think there was a period for about three years running in the run into um, the 2016 election when Northern Ireland was second only to London in, a, in attracting foreign direct investment. Mm -hmm. And that is a remarkable achievement for a, a country of just under two million people. Um, I think that we as a region actually when we have devolution functioning, we do punch way above our weight in terms of the sort of access that we get around the world, particularly in places like Washington DC. So very powerful people are very interested in what's going on here, and that right. can be used to the benefit of all of our people. Okay, well, let's move on to our next question. And uh, this one is from Alison Fairley, who's a teacher from Lisbon. Alison. Hi. My elderly relative lives alone in a house in Belfast. She has numerous health issues. It's obvious when I go to visit her that she has to choose between food and heat. I actually put an extra coat on to go into her house. What would you say about her genuine concerns about the rocketing cost of living and energy prices? Eden Connolly. Um I mean, it's a story that you'll hear from many people. Uh, this elderly relative of Alison has to choose between eating or heating. Uh, what can be done about it? What would you say to her? I, I think everyone is, is, is feeling the pinch, but those who are more economically vulnerable are feeling the pinch more, more, more than others. We have seen uh, inflation that we haven't seen in, in, in many years. The inflation in January uh, was twice that in December. The inflation in January was the highest it had been uh, since December 2012. Global commodity prices are the highest they have been uh, since 2011. Oil prices are 53% uh, uh, percent higher than they were this time last year. Ford, petrol, diesel. So what do we do? I, I, I think there is, has been a, 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 a real move by a, a lot of uh, businesses to absorb a lot of that cost. When you look at the prices that have, that have uh, gone up, the fact that some prices are up 35, 36 uh, percent, whereas in the stores on, on, on their, the shop shelves, they've, they've only gone up a, a but, few percent. But some people, I mean, some surveys do suggest that the basic basket of, of goods has gone up more than the inflation rate. Well, the inflation rate is the inflation rate because it hasn't gone up on the shop shelves. That's the, the shop price index is reflected of that. Um, what you need to look at is how the commodity prices have gone up and how that is actually translated into uh, the, the finished goods. I think we do need a UK government intervention. We need a UK government intervention, especially on, on fuel policy, not only uh, to help consumers, but to help businesses. And if businesses are able to make those savings, then they can be then passed on uh, to the, the consumers. But outside of the UK, there is a global uh, commodity crisis going on. We're seeing, for example, okay. things coming from Asia. Instead of costing $3,000 to get here uh, for, a boat, uh, for a container load, it's now $20,000. Uh, well, Simon Hoare, if we need a UK government intervention, is this something that the UK government can have an impact on? Uh, is, is Stormont, whether it has an executive or not, powerless on this? 
Um, no, but n nobody is powerless because all voices must and can be heard because they can have a influence. I mean, the question uh, and, and Nate is absolutely right. We're approaching a perfect storm of inflation, cost of living pressures, food going up, um, uh, interest rates going up, and all of those impacting on business and other confidences. You ask what can be done. I'd, I'd make three suggestions. Um, I think there should be a very targeted approach on VAT linked to recipients uh, who have benefits, universal credit and the like. I think the power companies need to be very flexible on repayment plans, particularly those who are on prepaid meters, who are paying over the odds for their unit costs, often the very poorest uh, in our society. And we do have to put our foot to the floor in a drive for sustainable, um, green, UK-wide uh, energy. There's little or no point going down the fracking route. There is little or no point having a continuing reliance upon overseas gas and the like. We have all this natural energy producing resource. We need to find new and innovative ways to fund it and to bring it to market much sooner and much faster than we're currently doing. Okay, let's go to the audience again. And I think Emma uh, perhaps had her hand up there. Emma. Thank you. Um, I just wanted to put to Mr. Hoare, um, he suggested some market policies that could be used there for uh, individuals who are experiencing poverty at the moment. But the, the, the reality is that it has been decades of Tory austerity measures that have led us to the position that we are in now. The rise of food banks over the last decades has increased by over 200% in some areas. Northern Ireland used to have one, we now have over 17. So these are actual points where the Tory party, a member which you, uh, sorry, which you are a member of, can actually make real and meaningful change for people today, not off sharking the responsibility onto the market for mistakes that this Tory government have made. Um, very quickly, uh, Simon Hoare, just come back on that. Well, I wasn't trying to pass the buck. I, I think it, the, the customer and their provider, I think the providers can, can be far more flexible. But look, we've taken more people out of poverty. You, you know the litany of statistics almost as well as I do. We've taken more people uh, out of poverty. We've increased uh, the national uh, living wage. Um, all, all of these things, we have a growing economy, more people uh, in work than any time, um, certainly since before the pandemic. Are there people suffering today? Yes, there are. Of course there are. And, and, and we have to do all that we can. But just to trot out, if I may say so, the sort of slightly tired diatribe that this is of Tory policies well, 10 years ago. You have, been in, government. Said, you have been in government feel, for feel, a long feel, time, but, so it's, but, a, it's but, perhaps a fair point to raise. Uh, let me go to uh, Felicity Houston. And inflation are going up across the world. Felicity Houston, I mean, yes, perhaps we can't blame the government entirely, but this government has been in power for a long time. Oh, it has, yes, absolutely. But, you know, all bets were off come March 2020. You can't turn off the international economy flick it back on, flick it off, flick it back on, flick it off, and so on, and expect things to run as they did before. And that's what we're suffering from. I mean, Aiden's figures about the difficulties of bringing goods across the world is one of the biggest impacts. You know, the sheer cost, as you say, of the container, never mind all the stuff in it. And I was listening last night to a, a man working in the building industry saying he can hedge some of his costs by buying in advance, but not everything. And one of his big problems is, is wages. Okay. Wage inflation is massive. This is a horrendous set of circumstances, and it comes from, I think, from the outworkings of what we did to ourselves two years ago. OK, so you, you're seeing the COVID uh, impacts and, and coming out of that. Uh, Brigitte uh, in the audience there uh, wanted to say something. Brigitte. No, well, I agree with a former previous member here in the audience. There's been years of Tory austerity. Um, recently, the £20 uplift on universal credit was cut, which was there during COVID. Uh, there was no need for that. Um, there has been... You know, there has been lot, lots of sectors that no pay rise for a long, long time. Um, the, poverty is, is one of the biggest issues that should be dealt with, but hasn't been dealt with. And actually, poverty has increased um, here in, in Northern Ireland. And uh, it is really time that politicians focus on that. Okay. Because, it, you know, it, it, it is very, very worrying what's happening. And for people who can't heat the houses yeah. and they have to really make a decision between heating and eating, uh, it's brutal. 
It's a, it's a very difficult one. Christopher Stalford, for instance, um, a new survey from the National Institute of Economic and Social Research said Northern Ireland now faces an extreme poverty surge with 25,000 homes being forced into destitution. It, I mean, these figures are frightening. It does, and I actually have seen this firsthand because through my constituency office, I coordinate with the food bank in terms of helping people with the, the tokens. So you come to my office, you get the token, and then you're able to go to the food bank to collect the parcel. I have seen an enormous surge over the course of the last couple of years in the number of people availing of that service in my constituency office. Similarly, in terms of energy prices, and I, I'm, I'm open to correction here, but I'm almost certain the figure was one energy, com one gas company raised the prices by 39% in one go. How can you expect your customers to sustain a price increase like that? I mean, that is just, that is outrageous. And in terms of energy, there is talk, and I don't know whether or not it'll come to anything, there is talk that the Chancellor is making, is arguing with him, arguing about making some sort of an intervention in terms of VAT on energy prices. And this brings me back to the earlier discussion. Because of the rules that we operate under via the protocol, every other part of the United Kingdom would be able to avail of that intervention, but Northern Ireland wouldn't. Not true. So you're, those are uh, just as an example. You're worried that Northern Ireland may not benefit uh, from any VAT reduction, Chris Hazard. Well, that point's not true, but let me deal it with the, the wider issue about the cost of, cost of living. There's no doubt there are global issues. The cost of daily essentials are on the rise. There's no doubt about that. But I'm sorry, the British government need to do much more and they need to take more responsibility. But you take we, Simon Hoare's point have seen, that this is an international issue and Felicity Houston makes the point that there's all sorts of changes happening because the economy, the world economy, was locked down for two years. Yeah, and for the supposedly the fifth richest economy in the world to have one of the, the worst uh, support systems for those who are unemployed, one of the uh, less generous uh, statutory sick pay for those people who need it. It's unacceptable. We have seen a situation over the last 10 years where the tax burden has went from those who with the broader shoulders to the poorest uh, in our society. That's not acceptable. The British government need to tackle some of these big fossil fuel companies. We have seen this week, for example, that BP and Shell have, have £40 billion in profit uh, recorded this year. £147 billion in the last 10 years going to shareholders. We need to see a windfall tax on, on these uh, fossil fuel companies. The Tories did it in the 1980s. If Thatcher can do it in 1982, Boris Johnson can do it in 2022. Well, okay, well that's, we all, that's, sorry, we also, we also me, need to oh. see, see the hike in national insurance is coming in April. That's going to hit workers and families hardest and the Tories, I'm afraid, have to take responsibility okay, for that. Let me bring Alison back in who asked the question. Um, Alison, have you heard anything here that, that gives you hope or have you any other suggestions for our panel? Well, just, I mean, poverty for some people is very, very real. Um, and I know we're all hit by, the, you know, all the sort of fuel prices and whatever, but there are certain people who are really, really struggling. And it was interesting. Yes, thank you for some of your comments. Yeah. Um, OK, well, thank you for that. And Simon Hall, you mentioned uh, the fact <coughs> that uh, welcome uh, a VAT reduction. Is that something that you see coming through? And could Northern Ireland be stuck because of the protocol rules? Um, I, I certainly would, would like to see it, but I think it would have to be targeted to those most in need. Otherwise, you know, the hugely wealthy would have a VAT reduction on their fuel prices, which wouldn't be the thing. But this is nothing to do with membership of the European Union or the single market. I mean, Chris Hazard is right. Spain has reduced its level of VAT on domestic fuel. To the, the last time I looked, Spain was a member of the European Union. I didn't say that. So was France. I, I didn't say that. What I said was that Northern Ireland, because we're operating under different rules, would not be able to... No, because it would, fall, Chris, I think it would fall within the state aid rules. Yes. That's correct. Okay. Which we've well, just put through, so I think it would be okay. Yeah. We shall examine the detail of this if it does indeed happen. Uh, so that's one uh, to keep an eye on, see if there is a reduction in VAT. Will Northern Ireland benefit? Now, let's move on to our next question. And our next questioner is Mary Hannon Fletcher, who is a professor of biomedical science at the University of Ulster. Good evening. Thank you. Um, I'd like to ask the panel, should we be ending COVID restrictions, given the high continued numbers of infections, especially in school children? Felicity Houston. Well, I'm personally delighted that we have 
ended our restrictions. Uh, the Danes did it about 10 days ago, and they have, I think, probably worse levels of COVID than we have, and they're very happy to do so. And I think I'm delighted that we're doing the same thing. Um, we, I, I think for societal reasons, never mind personal ones, we have to go back to something like we used to have, that life used to be. And there will be all sorts of arguments about people who have health issues and can't be exposed to COVID, but that is the same with many other diseases that we live with. And I think... Um, we are all very glad, or very many of us are very glad in Northern Ireland that there is light finally at the end of the tunnel after two extremely difficult years, which have, amongst other things, caused many of the problems we have talked about earlier. Well, Christopher Salford, I mean, those that may be wary of all these restrictions disappearing, um, you know, would point to things like Northern Ireland's high prevalence uh, of COVID at the highest region in the UK. One in 13 here, according to the ONS survey, had COVID in the first week of February. It's one in 25 in Scotland and Wales, one in 19 in England. So it's much, much higher here. Uh, and yet we've just got rid of all the, all the rules. I think throughout uh, the executive, in particular the Minister for Health, have leaned very heavily upon the advice that they've been given by the Chief Medical Officer and the Chief Scientific Advisor. So I can't imagine that this... Uh, these recommendations would have come forward had they not been based upon the advice given. I think ultimately there does come a point where we have to decide as a society are we going to continue with the sort of perpetual restrictions. Ultimately I think what has been decided this week is that moving from basically mandatory to voluntary uh, arrangements, people who feel comfortable um, with masks or what have you will still be perfectly free to do that. Um, and that's their, their right and their prerogative. But I think ultimately, the executive has been very careful around leaning into that advice that I mentioned earlier. I also think it is an opportunity actually, because it has been a long, hard two years. I mean, I, I lost a relative to COVID, so I know the impact that it has. It has been a hard, long two years, but ultimately I hope, I think that the announcement that has been made is giving people hope, a hope that we will return to normal, a hope that life can get back to normal, and I think that's a good thing. Okay, let me bring uh, Adam in from our audience, and Adam, I hope you don't mind uh, me telling people that you have, in fact, yourself got COVID at the moment, so you're self-isolating, uh, and of course, with the wonders of technology, you can join us. Uh, what do you make of the fact that the, the rules uh, now become guidance rather than law? I think it's uh, a good uh day for people seeing the end of the light of COVID restrictions. As you said, I went, I'm i just back from England and got COVID. I am triple jabbed. I think the majority of people are double or triple jabbed. So all I've had is a sore throat and a cough that lasted about two days. So I'm hoping that I have to take a test tomorrow, which will be day six. So I hope it's negative, but I don't think it will be. So then that'll be, what, 10 days after the isolate for. So it's just thing that born of the isolation. I know people have had it worse. So um, is it time, or well, is it the right time? It's sort of treated like the flu and we sort of just get on with our lives. Yeah, I mean, uh, let me, Chris Hazard, I mean, it, it, Adam there is self-isolating. Uh, interestingly, the minister who announced uh, this move himself is self-isolating. It seems in Northern Ireland now, even the self-isolating rules are just strong guidance. There's no legal requirement uh, behind them. And people might think we're just moving a little bit too fast here. Uh, well, I've no doubt there's, there's a fear out there uh, amongst certain sectors. Um, and I think that speaks to the seriousness of the issue. Uh, but there's no doubt over recent weeks, people have been relieved to hear the health minister say we're now uh, taking this path. Like Christopher, I, I can only presume uh, we haven't seen the guidance or the advice from the chief medical officer or the chief scientific officer that it's based, re really grounded uh, in the evidence and where we're going. I, I think it'd be good to hear from the CMO or the CSO or the health minister in the next couple of days to talk out the guidance to people. Well, I think and the chief scientific officer was uh, on the media uh, today, uh, so they are starting to get that message out there. And I think that's important. And to, to, to spell out, you know, look, we, we may be re reducing some of the onus on people or what they have to do, but please remain vigilant. If you, if you feel comfortable wearing a mask, please continue to do it. And I, I think certainly I'll be keen to do that. And I would put that message to people. If you're comfortable still to do it, do it. And I think we need to really respect our workers as well, our frontline workers over the last number of years who've put their life on the line to go out and give us the essential services we need. We now need to make sure that those workers um, are involved in co-design now with their businesses and government uh, agencies and public services to make sure we just 
just don't push them back into a dangerous situation. Well, Aidan Connolly, what's going to happen uh, when people go out uh, to the shops? Uh, will shops uh, continue to ask people to wear masks or will it just be a case of do what you want? Well, we will follow the guidance. Um, I am not a doctor and I am definitely not a virologist. Um, so what we have always done is to follow the uh, advice that came from the Department of Health and then through to the Department of Economy, which then uh, came to us. Now, we didn't influence that advice. What we did was to try to explain how that would impact on the various different sectors uh, within uh, business. What we've tried to do from the very start, our priority has been uh, to keep our colleagues in the front line and also our, our shoppers uh, safe. Um, the guidelines have changed and, and, and that is, is, is the law. The regulations become guidelines. We would still ask people to use common sense. You know, you don't have to stand right over someone. You can continue to, to, to wash uh, your hands or, or use hand sanitizer, And uh, you can wear a mask if, if, if you want to. I personally will continue to wear a mask quite simply because it cost me a fortune to get one that fitted the beard. <laughs> <laughs> OK, so specially designed masks can still be worn. Uh, it's your own choice if you go to the shops. Uh, let's uh, go to our audience uh, and I think, uh, is it uh, John Paul's there. Hi, uh, yes, I just think my personal opinion is it is great to see light at the end of the tunnel after, you know, two years of COVID. Um, like I've worked in the care sector, so I've seen firsthand what it's been like. I've had COVID, my mum's had COVID, but it's great just to see that things are starting to come, you know, a bit, a bit of normality. And I think, you know, you'd be hard pressed to find anyone that would disagree with that. But at the same time, you know, if you did see like a new variant the way it was with COVID at the very beginning of this and, you know, it was more transmissible, I would personally support, you know, restrictions coming back in, you know, so you know, social distancing, um, just to keep people healthy. But again, that's only if that ever occurs. Uh, yeah, so I mean, you mentioned the health uh, and the care sector uh, there. Um, that's one area where we're still waiting for some clarity on what the rules are. But obviously, from your own experience, do you think that uh, care homes should be freer to receive visitors at the moment, at least? Yeah, I think, um, again, for the residents that live in these care homes, you know, they've maybe they've known often for two years about, you know, they've just been stuck maybe in their fold or their nursing home. And... Yes, like anyone, they've, they've missed their family. So I think for them, it would be good to have their family and their friends coming in to visit them again, just getting back to that normality. Same for the staff. I'm sure they'd like to see family members coming in and putting a smile on, on their family members' faces who live, live in these homes. Uh, Simon Hoare, what have we learnt over the last couple of years? Because there's been quite, I suppose, an exercise debate as to whether you're pro certain restrictions, pro-mask or anti-mask or pro vaccine or anti-vaccine. But what have we learned overall, do you think, uh, now looking at this and what we might do in the future if we face a similar threat? I, I think the two obvious learnings are there has to be a domestic resilience in the manufacture of things like uh, PPE. We've got a very strong pharma sector. We need to support that and see that grow. But I think it's clear now that there needs to be a greater role if there's a future pandemic of a global level, that the WHO, stroke the UN, would have a far greater coordinating role because the piecemeal national approach, which has been adopted across the world, has been very confusing for citizens. It's been very confusing for business. And arguably, if we'd all been pulling in the same direction and doing broadly the same sort of things, we might have got on top of it a, a bit quicker. I think the other thing we've learned is there aren't many scientists in politics, although there seem to be an awful lot of politicians who think that they are scientists, that we have to see this as being data-led. It's not a debate for ideology and, and, and dogma. I, I welcome the fact that we're in a position where the data is indicating that the rules and the regulations can be relaxed, but this is not irreversible. If the data starts to go in the opposite direction... If people don't use common sense, uh, I, I agree with what Aidan and others were saying, just sort of common sense needs to still be at the fore, then we could be OK. OK. But um, we have to understand if the figures go in the wrong direction, restrictions by definition are going to have to come back if we want to keep people safe and well. Christopher Salford, what do you think? Um, have we chosen the right moment then uh, to, to loosen up? I think so, um, because as I said, uh, the, the government would have acted very much the, throughout this. They've leaned very heavily on the advice of, uh, of Dr McBride and Professor Young. So I imagine that that, that advice will have informed this decision. Um, just the original questioner asked a question, and I do think this is, uh, they, they mentioned the reference to children. Um, I have uh, a daughter who was going through an examination process 
uh, this year is 10, so you can tell what the examination process <laughs> was. Um, and it was very, very difficult for my 10-year-old daughter to put a mask on her face for extended periods of time. So I think if we're, if we're mentioning children, this has been traumatic. Mm. This experience has been traumatic the last two years, losing school, losing contact with friends, losing out on, on so much. I, I personally, and I obviously have to see the advice, but I think, you know, for young children, I think that mask wearing has just been a very, very difficult and traumatic experience. OK, we'll have to leave it there. I'm afraid plenty uh, to discuss. No doubt we'll be coming back to this subject. And thanks to Mary for the question. Now, our final question comes from Jack Armstrong. Jack's a PhD student from Belfast. Jack. Um, thanks, Jim, and good evening, everyone. Uh, my question for the panel is, how should the UK and other NATO countries react to a Russian invasion of Ukraine? Simon Hoare. Well, I think we, have, we do have to learn those painful lessons from the 1930s. We've got to stick up for our values in the first instance and not feel feared to assert them. Um, I think America has to come out of her isolationism. Um, it's all well and good wearing the badge, which says we're the world's global superpower, and then not stepping up to follow through to make a stand for the liberties and the values which we all hold dear. And NATO needs to get its mojo, because there is going to be a question at some point, is what is the purpose of NATO if it doesn't stand firm, resolute in, in, in these matters? But if we let Putin win on this, he will nibble away at the former Soviet socialist republics, bit by bit, one by one, somebody okay. speaks Russian, somebody has cultural R Russian links, and we will find a world where tyranny is winning and liberty and democracy and the rule of law is in retreat. Um, Chris Hazard, uh, NATO needs to find its mojo, says Simon Hoare. Uh, well, I think that's a particularly glib uh, comment. Finding its mojo means death and destruction. And, you know, that's what conflict is about. So what we need to see now is a de-escalation of tensions. We need to see Russia respect Ukraine's national self-determination, respect borders. But we also need NATO to understand that expansion and enhancement over the last number of years has caused regional instability as well if, in Eastern if Europe. If Ukraine wants to join NATO, so, surely that's its choice. So we need to see institutions such as the United Nations take a lead role. We need to see an end to megaphone diplomacy. Uh, we need to see adults around the table. And I think the United Nations is key to play a role there. Um, Christopher Salford. I, can, I, can, I struggle to, to think of a, of a conflict where the United Nations actually took a lead in bringing conflict to an end. Um, so I, I'm not going to place my faith uh, in the United Nations. I think it's very important that politicians remember it's well for us to talk at a, a high br brow level about some of this, but when you're talking about sending people's sons and daughters into war zones, you need to be very cognizant of that fact. These are young people and we need to be very careful about what we do. By the same token, I don't think there's any question in this circumstance that Vladimir Putin is the aggressor. I don't think anyone could reasonably doubt that. And I think you raised an interesting point. If the government, the democratically elected government of Ukraine, and remember, part of their country is already being occupied by Russia. If the democratically elected government of Ukraine wish for their country to join NATO, that is their right. And, you know, just as Simon talked about America viewing itself very much as, you know, the world's superpower. Putin cannot view Eastern Europe as merely a Russian satellite in which he can do whatever he wants. Those days are gone. That ended with the fall of the wall in 89. Well, uh, Felicity Houston, what, what do you make of the question? What should the UK do? Oh, well, I mean, I, f I fear that it is very hard to know what's really going on out there. Um, you know, the first casualty of war is truth. And I do feel that. I really haven't a clue what the actual situation really is. I think that we are all making our own um, views about Ukraine, which is, you know, a bit like how people from outside think they know mm. about Northern Ireland. And, I would, you know, it's just a little, little, little conflict, blah, blah. Well, it's the same in Ukraine. It's quite a complex society with a 20% roughly are Russians. Uh, you know, we've had the Crimea thing that Russia has now taken back, etc. You know, it is wrong for us to just stand there and tell your Ukrainians what we think as nice civilised Western people, what they should do. There's far too much mm. of that in the world. Okay. So I think um, Putin has paid a blinder. He All has right. split NATO asunder. He's a great troll. Is it? 
Brits, <laughs> because is a tactician, I suppose, uh, Aaron. But what, what do you think the, the, the UK government and NATO should do? Well, I uh, think that they're going to get a big push uh, from uh, the US to find some sort of settlement on the protocol, quite simply because they'll want all the players on the pitch when it comes to, to NATO. Uh, I was actually talking to my son about this, um, and I was because he was asking me about what's happening, and I was trying to explain to him that in the eighties, whenever I was growing up, and the you know the song Russians by Sting and all those movies that we had about the Cold War, and that this was something that we lived with through that time up until eighty nine ninety. That's not what I wanted for him, and hopefully we'll not get to that stage again. I, I think there needs to be talks immediately, and we need to, to realise that, just as Christopher said, that it's other people's sons who are going to be out going out and doing the fighting. This needs to be resolved by talking now. Well, that's all I'm afraid we've got uh, time for on that question, and indeed for the programme this evening. Thanks to everyone uh, who took part in our programme. Thanks to our panellists, and indeed our audience, who all joined us uh, from home, and of course to you for watching. Until the next time, from all of us here on Spotlight Special, a very good night.